evening, everyone. Good evening. And um, this is our uh, third or fourth, third or fourth uh, Wednesday night devotion Bible study during Lent. Um, I like to open up with prayer. Um, dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, glean your word, God. Most importantly, dear God, uh, discuss your word as we continue to grow in who you are. God asks that all those who are present in person, bless them. Those who are looking online and those who want to be here but can't be here, bless all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. It's, just, evening. it's a wonderful opportunity again to be in a, in, in a, in a devotion Bible study as we continue to glean um, our Lent devotion drawn to the cross. Um, and so this has been, um, for me, um, a phenomenal uh, opportunity to, you know, with coffee in the morning or in the evening to really read God's Word. And so today, you know, what I'd like to do is, as I said to you previous times, I was hoping that each one of you, if had the opportunity, would, you know, read each day and jot some notes down. So kind of what I'd like to do today, if possible, is kind of bring the room and, uh, and have you all share with me um, which particular devotion you did during the week that really spoke to you as we think about, um, as we come on this Wednesday's devotion, which is um, speaking about new eyes. And um, I always talk about new eyes because it's, um, you know, it, it's one John 13, which is part of the, uh, the last supper when Jesus Christ uh, showed his uh, uh, people that were his disciples, he said, you were once servants and now you are my friends. And he gave a demonstration of washing their feet, Jesus washing their feet, and in turn became the Last Supper. And so he says, um, just as I have loved you, you also shall love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love if you have love for one another. And what Jesus is saying to us here is that when we love one another, we show the world who Jesus is. It's not about um, uh, political organizations. It's not about particular laws, but it's about love. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. And by loving one another, the world will know who I am. And so I want to start back, go back to Thursday, and just go through and just kind of have each one of you, if you know, if you have, give everybody an opportunity to kind of share which particular devotion spoke to them this week in this third, uh, uh, second week, uh, as we go to the second week of uh, of Lent. Uh, but kind of um, the first one was show me. I don't know if anyone read that one, but I want to start with that one to see if anybody had any particular thing that they felt they really spoke to them about. Show me. Mark, what Jim wants to say. Jim. <laughs> you can speak, Jim. <laughs> well, the real take-home message in show me <clears throat> is that we shouldn't just write down a resume. Or, you know, like a Vita, whatever we've done with our life so far. God already knows that. You know? mm -hmm. He said, Show me. You know? mm -hmm. And so, I did example here was My Fair Lady, where Eliza Doolittle said, Don't say, mm -hmm, Show me. You know? mm -hmm. So, the one that came to my mind is, I'm from Missouri. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm from Missouri. In other words, that's a show me state. Mm -hmm. Somebody gotcha. showed up wearing a bad suit at a meeting and turned out that the guy wearing a good suit had taken it from the guy with a bad suit. <laughs> well, that's what he said, but not mm -hmm. uh, in public. But the man came in, in with a shabby suit and said, no, neither of us had one. You found one at the last minute. Mm -hmm. I didn't. So show me, you know. I'm from Missouri. Show me. Mm. Anyway, this mm. says if you really do something, you don't 
you know, actions speak louder than words. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And talk about feeding the faith of the Lamb. So my take on was that really showing your faith when you're doing um, and working with the most vulnerable people in society, that you're not just being a savior, you're actually being an ally. You're working with them to overcome their suffering. It's not that you're swooping in and giving a care package because they were in need, but you're showing and you're sitting there and you're being compassionate and empathizing with them. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister D. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Anyone else? I have one. Mm -hmm. I, I know I wasn't here, but I, uh, for three days, I let a, a woman who I met on the street on Madison Avenue, mm -hmm. she had a sign that said, crime victim. Mm -hmm. And I gave her my last change. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said, oh, yeah, I've been a victim of crime, too. And I asked her a few questions. She said, well, I don't want to bore you with the details. She didn't want to talk about it. And I, so I, I said, OK. And I was going to the Madison Theater. And I went in there. And she actually came in. Mm -hmm. She came in there. She actually had money, which was <coughs> weird. But she was sitting on the street with her stuff. And we and she was polite and, and smart. And so I, after a while, I said, do you have somewhere to stay? She goes, no. I said, you can stay in my place. And I gave her, I ended up giving her three days to stay there. Because um, I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Amen. Amen. And I fed her as well, very healthy. Good. Let her sleep. Praise God. Thank you. That's beautiful. And, and, that, and, that's, and, and, that, and that's showing what Jesus says here. I don't want to hear how great your faith is. Show me. And that's an example of action. When you, when you can um, begin to I always say to people, when you see people say things like, uh, you see somebody on the street and you say, uh, brother, my sister, I'll pray for you. And, um, and I'm like, prayer is fine, but uh, can you give me something to eat while you're praying for me? Or, so praying you know, with your feet. Praying with your feet or praying with your actions. Well, praying with your feet means... No. Oh, oh, that's what you meant. Oh, I'm sorry. I got you. I got you. I apologize, D. Right, right. Pray with your action, with your feet, right? Action, right. And so, thank you. That that's that, thank you for Sister D and Jim and um, Rebecca's uh, uh, Rebecca's uh, testimony there. Next day was uh, Thursday, which was be perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And uh, be perfect. You got to be kidding. That's what I read first. And I, and I said, uh, uh, you know, I thought about that, about be, 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 be perfect. So I don't know if anyone gleaned that and had an opportunity to read that. Uh, uh, so, um, and what I got from that, um, what, what, I, what I did a check mark from was it says, we will never be perfect on this side of eternity. And that kind of, believe it or not, gave me some relief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm being honest. Is it because you're Well, it gave me, you know, <laughs> thank you, Sister D. I, I think it gave me some relief because I am a perfectionist, but even more importantly, what I think, I think to add to what Sister D is saying, um, when I fail, I'm learning not to beat myself up as much right. because there is no perfection on this side. You know, Jesus said, by thought, word, or deed, if, if I didn't do the deed, if I thought it or I said it, it's all in sin. And so when I saw that we will never be perfect on this side of eternity, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the reminder. Right? Now, also other people will say, well, you know, that does... That doesn't give anyone a license to sin and just do whatever you want. But I think it's in the perfection that Sister B pointed out that you strive for perfection like Jesus, but no, we, none of us can fit that. If we did, there would be no reason for what we're studying now, which is the, the cross. The, the cross represents our imperfection and Jesus' perfection and giving us an example of it. And so I don't know if anyone else want to add to that. 
I can say one thing to that. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents were perfectionists, and it uh, instilled in me that. And so it was always a matter. Of, was, I I found myself getting just uh, irritated at myself, mm -hmm. usually, for just not doing something right the first time. And I'm still like that. I'm just finally, finally realized that was where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it was like nothing was ever, you know, good enough. And uh, I mean, I'm like that with like a crossword puzzle. I'm like really bad. Right. But I'm finally getting that out of my system to just be more uh, comfortable and accepting. And also know that you have to make mistakes to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's just part of a process. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It says here, at the end, Jesus walked the way of sorrow to the cross while his willingness endured the full wrath of God against sin so that we might live as fully forgiven children and serve as his compassionate disciples throughout our earthly pilgrimage. pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And it says, compassionate Savior, embody us and embolden us to be your compassionate disciples even when it means suffering and loss to bear your cross. And I think the perfection part, as I was sharing with a young woman earlier today, she's a bio major, and I said to her, you know, do you, John can relate to that, and I, and I said to her, well, you know, when, you, when you hear bio majors, I say, well, are you gonna be a professor? Are you going to medical school? Are you he says, oh no, I just wanted to pick, I like bio in high school. I was like, okay. And she says, uh, I just wanted a major that nobody would uh, think that was easy. <laughs> and I said, but is that what you want to do? And um, she said, I don't know. And I said, that's something to think about. And so I think, and I said, you know, I said, and I, said, and I gave her an example. I had a young woman in my office, Maya, the day before, who... You know, 3A GPA, she's African Studies Sociology major, very eloquent, very young, you know, just very bright young woman. And I said, but she's walking in her gift. And I said to her, to this young woman, I said, why don't you allow God to make room for your gift, whatever that is. And what I wanted her to understand was that bio is wonderful. The problem with what she's doing, one, she's not doing well at it, Right? Because, you know, she's not focusing the way she should be focusing. But even more importantly, I said, why are you doing it? And so I say that to say that's where the perfection part comes in for us. That we feel like at times that, you know, we must always do it always right. And, um, and I think God wants us, Jesus wants to show us that if we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. You know, and I think that's that's the gist of kind of this this, this perspective that I got, that perfection, um, you know, I heard someone say, and I don't know if you would agree with this, they said success is temporary. Hmm. You know, that no matter what you do in life, and no matter how great you are, if I asked anybody here today, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1980? None of y'all would know that. If I said who won it in '84, we, we, you know, we probably wouldn't know unless you were unless you were master if you knew a specific field that you potentially followed. I say that to say that even though no matter how successful you might be at something, um, it's going to be forgotten. So I'm going I'm to move on to the next lesson with this one. If you ever heard of a family life today with um, James Dobson, he said some years ago he got a phone call and uh, it was a janitor from his old high school. And he said, are you uh, James Dobson? He said, yes I am. He says, um, I just want to know, do you want these trophies? They're in the garbage. And the janitor called him to say, I wanted to, I heard that you know you were James Dobson and you were you said you were a great tennis pro, but they're throwing these trophies away. 
And the moral of the story was that in the doctor said in the 60s, I was one of the best tennis pro play, I was one of the best tennis, high school tennis players in, in Indiana. And he says, no matter how successful you are, all your trophies will end up in the garbage. <laughs> right? So so that's that's kind of the uh, the gist of, 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 of the, the, the perfection thing. So moving on to the next day, it says a pure heart. Um, and it's, and, and it's uh, Matthew 5 8, says, which is Matthew 5 is one of my uh, favorite texts when it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When you hear that, blessed are the pure in heart, and they will see God, what do you think? Honest. Honest? Okay. Honest? Who else? Pure heart. What about children? Do you think children have pure hearts? Yeah. <laughs> Until they're three. Most of them. What do you say, John? You say, John? Three? <laughs> three? It's a whole other story, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, let the little children come to me for yeah. the kingdom of God belongs to them. And so when you say pure heart, you said, what did you say? Honest. Honest. What was another word? What, what, what else would you... Uh, Think about a pure heart. Kind. Kind. Okay. Kind. Honest. Anybody else? A person who does not purposely pursue evil. Hmm. Perfectly a person who purposely does not pursue evil. And you know that and it's funny when you said that, Sister Sharon. One of the proverbs, and I know what I can try to think of it, it says the, the things that God detests, and it says those who feet rush into evil. That's an example of what you're saying right there. That, That's the opposite of a pure heart. Exactly, that's of a pure heart. Right, right, right. People who intentionally, right? Exactly. That's I like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. You know, pure heart. What, what do you think, Sister D? What do you think? Are we, when you hear the word pure heart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Joanne? No, I'm all, all for that. All for that? All for that? Pure heart? Um, you know, I have a pure heart. You have a pure yeah, heart? Amen. Absolutely. Amen. You know? Yeah. And, I, and I wrote here, uh, I said, uh, guilty for falling short and never be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, the gift following Christ, no matter what I do, I will never be perfect or do it right. Now, I, I wrote that thinking of usually what... What you just said, Sister Sharon, was a person who does not intentionally do evil. Because there are individuals who intentionally do evil. So I want to open up a can of worms here for yeah. a second. Right? Mm -hmm. When we look at what's going on with Ukraine mm -hmm. and Russia, I see that, from my opinion, mm -hmm. as a perspective of someone rushing into evil. I don't, you don't have to agree with me, but when I think of someone who would allow or want to, for whatever reason, uh, allow human beings to die because they want territory for whatever purpose, makes me wonder, are they rushing into evil? You know, um, some people would, you know, believe it or not, we've had some students at the university who are debating on the side of Russia. Well, I do believe it because both ends of the political, the far ends of the political spectrum right now are supporting Russia. It's just, you know, closely coming, I mean, people more in the middle um, are taking a more uh, realistic view. Right. But because of the way there's false news and stuff, I mean, mm -hmm. one of um, Jay's friends who, you know, you would not not expect her to be supporting Russia, but had, you know, saw the articles about, well, there were some Nazis in the Ukrainian military, mm -hmm. and so 
clearly Russia had a reason to be attacking Ukraine because there were Nazis in the Ukrainian military. Mm -hmm. There were some. Mm -hmm. But there were some Nazis in the military in a lot of countries. I mean, you know, it's... Um, but... And then, of course, on the very far right, they decided to support Russia. Right. 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 And I, I wonder... And I'm not, and I don't want to, I don't want to get into the thing with Trump, but I wonder if Trump was president, where we would be standing right now. I want, I just wonder. I, I just, I, I just, I, I'm not, I don't know. I don't think God wanted Trump to stay in office. Well, I, yeah, I, yeah, I believe that. Um, but I, but I also believe. I would have set this up. But I also believe that God, you know, when God says He reigns on the just and the unjust, and God is responsible for government. I do believe that when um, in our last sermon, our last text last week when we read Isaiah, when it says God's ways, when God says my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, well, we can perceive as a road to evil could be God's way of dealing with evil and good at the same time. When you look at the Old Testament, you see how when God, when David came before God to build his temple, and God said, you can't build my temple, David, because you have too much blood on your hands, right? So I always wondered, Brother Jim, was God telling David that because of the stuff that he had done in his sin, or was it because David was a warrior? Because you have to understand, David, you know, David was, listen, David was a killer. You know, remember one of the reasons why Saul got very angry with David, and got jealous of David, the women were chanting and said, Saul kills his thousand and David kills his ten thousand. You know what I mean? So David was no David was no punk. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. he, was, he was taking people out. You know? Um, and so when you look at that, you glean that, you say, what kind of God is this? But you gotta also understand what was going on before that happened. What God, these were the enemies of God, who God had said that these people not don't have their best interests in mind. And I think that's the that's where you really have to kind of glean and understand from the perspective of what you just shared when people say, well, the reason why they're supporting Russia is because there's Nazis. Well, you know, there's a segment of um, that, there's a segment of anti the Nazis in every society, including America, right? Um, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, they, when I had it that they said when President Obama was in office, they said he got a day about 400 threats to his life. Daily, daily through 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 me, you know, social media and just hate groups. He had at least four hundred uh, dressed his life every day, you know, every day. And I think the next one was about faithful forever. Mm -hmm. his, in his faithfulness, he was able to truly respond in a gracious way to all that. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And I believe that mm -hmm. going to that next lesson, you hit it on the nose, faithful forever. That I believe that's why God not only blessed him. Mm -hmm presidency but protected his presidency because you know and I remember Kroberg Paulson telling us D that he said the only way that Obama will stay in that job is if he's praying. He has to be a praying man. He has to be a man that has to look to God because he is something that this country or the world wasn't used to seeing. You know, when you get a name like his, you know, Barack Hussein Obama. Thank you for your short promise. Right. That you will be with me wherever I go. Wherever I go. Keep me faithful to you, no matter what may come my way. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that wasn't his mantra every day, I don't know what could have been. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Exactly. And so, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened of dismay. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And and it says here, and as he does in times of spiritual stumbling. Jesus calls us to repentance, is what I shared a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. In moments of weakness and failure, he empowers us to be strong and courageous mm -hmm. in times of success and egotism. He calls us to be humble ourselves and give him the glory. Mm -hmm. Humble ourselves. And I think, mm -hmm. I think humility is, is probably one of the greatest gifts any human being can have. I think humility yeah, allows people... <laughs> <laughs> got a whole bunch of chairs, you know. You ain't gonna find a chair. Yeah. Um, I won't like you. 
<laughs> you know, and I and, and, and one of my favorite on uh on the third Sunday, Faithful Forever, uh, the third Sunday of Lent, one of my favorite texts, and this is so true, it says, one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 8 and 5. And I think that we have to always remember that. That Jesus Christ, God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And will never leave you nor forsake you. And I can say that, I would say, to even the people of Ukraine yeah. and Russia and all of us who are going through whatever we're going through, God promised never to leave us nor forsake us. The psalmist David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So even David, in the midst of his trials and tribulations in Psalm 23, he said, I walk through the valley. And then say, I stay in the valley. I, you know, lament in the valley. I walk through the valley. And that's what we have to remember that um, the Word of God tells us that we, what we see going on in Ukraine and Russia and throughout the world, the political divide, is what is predicted. It said, Jesus says that man was brother will turn against sister, man will turn against his parents for my sake or not for my sake. And I think what we have to remember is, and this is something that as I, as I have gotten over and realized, which says faithful forever, this lesson, and as we go into the next day, that this is our temporary home. As Christians, you know, we have to, re we have to believe you know, um, we have to believe that this is not it. You know, my, my, one of my best friends, John, is a biologist. And uh, um, Mark Smith. And he, and, and he says, you know one of the biggest problems with science, Charles? And I'm like, you know, okay, Mark, here we go. What, what? Belief. Us scientists, we got to prove it. If you can't prove it, it's not true. And I'm like, that's the opposite of faith. He said, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, again, when you talk about faith, faith, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So we believe, you know, we, we, we believe that God will take care of us despite what we're going through. We believe that what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, that this world will come together to put a stop to this one way or another. We believe that because God is true and faithful to what he says. And when he said that I'm the same yesterday and today and forever, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I so, like that Joshua has 23 more chapters after this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That means that Joshua didn't forsake him either. He, he stayed with, with uh, his instructions. The verse before that it says, this book, Shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Mm -hmm. Then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have success. Right. And Amen. ten years after this, he heard this, he finished conquering the promised land. Right. He didn't just roll over and play dead. That's he, right. He had to come in and make war. That's North, right. middle, and south. That's right. And also what success is to some people is, I mean, is not like what success to a Christian would be per se. There are people who think that success is all about money, and then, you know, I think we Christians feel that success has to do more with you know, what kind of person we, be, we are and what we become mm -hmm. through our transformation of, of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I mean, that, that's a good point because we, when Brother Jim talked about success, the Joshua's success, those other 23 chapters, he was faithful to his call. And yet, what you're saying also, Sister Rebecca, is that, and what Sister B says about faithful forever, is that what was tied into, it really comes down to, you know, success. Success is always in how does it line up with God's plan. God is more concerned with our humanity. God is concerned with how we love, you know, what, what did he say to when, when the, when the, uh, the lawyers came to him and challenged him with the law. And, and, and he summed it up in two words. He summed it up in two scriptures. 
He says, what, what of the 613 laws, what, what are the greatest, Jesus? If you, he's, you know, you, you're the rabbi. You claim to be God in the flesh. Tell us the greatest commandments. And, and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments and all the laws and prophets. And so the Ten Commandments, all 613 laws, if you ever read them, and I've read them. I don't remember all of them, but I've read them. God knows I don't remember them all, but I've read them. <laughs> Everything. When you think about those laws, it deals with God and humanity. Don't, don't do this with your sister. Don't do that with an animal. Don't do this. I mean, that's, that's what the law said. From everything from keep the Sabbath. Don't do this. Don't do that. But it all dealt with your relationship with God, with your heart, your mind, and your soul, and it dealt with how we treat one another. That's why when I hear young people say things like, if God was so powerful and wonderful, why did so much evil? And I said, and I say, well, what I'm learning, we have evil by what you shared a few minutes ago, Sister Sharon, about people rushing into evil. I believe that God gives us the... And I heard Robbie Zacharias say this. He said that the greatest gift God gives us is to love each other unconditionally. That's a gift. And we choose how far that love goes. We do. I mean, we do. Come on, y'all. We got people in our lives. If we see them once a year, we'll be like, that's good enough. <laughs> But I think also, as we move on to open our things, mm -hmm. um, it says that God gives us a fresh start each day. Right. We do, and so, can I ask you, Sister Ding, with that open eyes, do we use that, do we use that fresh day? How do we use that fresh day? Well, we're giving free will to do the choice of um, being Christ-like, but it's thought, word, and deed. Sometimes when somebody cuts you off in traffic, that thought it may not be good. <laughs> but you get Most of the time it is, right? <laughs> yeah, you get a fresh start the next day. So and so, so the next... striving for excellence and mm. striving to be Christ-like. Okay, I like that. Okay, okay, all right. So with that in mind, with open eyes, it says, yet... The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. 1 Peter 3.12. Mm -hmm. And it says, yet Jesus not only gives everything, he also receives everything. He not only says everything he has heard, he also hears everything that is said to him. He not only reveals everything he has seen, he also eliminates everything that is shown to him. When I read this, I'm just telling you this is my perspective. I thought of my, I used to hear my mother says that God does not hear sinners. <laughs> and I used to scratch my head and say, well, Jesus, if you don't hear sinners, yeah. how can you? <laughs> you know, I was, you know, I used to hear, I used to hear, you know, and I used to hear that as a kid and I said, well, if you don't hear sinners, then how will I ever have an opportunity to, you know, to get right with God, right? That's what I say. And all the time is about telling the glory of God, so that doesn't mean it. Exactly, right, right. So I say that, when I read this, when I was reading this, I was saying to myself, well, I think my mother was actually wrong. Because I, I believe, I, I believe that God hears and knows everything. You know what I mean? I, I don't think you can hide anything from God. God knows what's in my heart and your heart even before I open up my mouth. Right? So I always used to say to myself, and I think I challenged a friend of mine a few years ago, I said, well, why do I got to pray? Well, what? If God knows everything, why am I praying? If he knows everything, why am I asking? Right? You hear people say predestination and what's going to be. So I say, I ask that question. And then I began to realize that prayer perhaps it's not about me talking to God, but maybe God talking to me. That maybe through prayer, 
God gives me or give all of us an opportunity to see things from a different lens. I'll say this with you, and I believe this, and I shared this a few weeks ago in my sermon. When you pray for your enemies, now, that is the hardest thing to do. It is hard, and people say it's not, and I say to them, then you're really not being honest. It is hard to pray for people who does not have your best interests. It is hard to pray for people who you knew just don't like you. But yet, there's something about when you pray, it gives, it can give you a, a state of peace, but it also can allow you to say, or for God to say to you, I know what I'm doing. I have this. You don't have to understand. Because Charles, remember, I'm not you. I don't think like you. I don't act like you. Right? And my acts are not like yours. And so sometimes prayer, when you have open, when God is talking about an open, open ears and that righteousness, I believe that God prays a way for us to listen to God. You know, I always tell a lot of young people, and of course, a person like me that has the biggest mouth. I used to say to them, God gives us two ears and one mouth. For a reason. Yeah. Right? I mean, he does. He, he gave, if, if he wanted me to talk more, he could have given me two miles and one ear. If I'm looking at some Star Trek or Lost in Space, I would see that, right? But he, he gives us two ears. And he gives us one mouth. And when, and when James says to be quick to listen, slow to speak, yet slow to anger. Because it is in the listening at times. And I know as I'm looking at my career the last seven years when I've taught to students, I've become a better listener. And when I was sitting there talking to this young woman today, when she was going 50 miles a minute, and I just shut my mouth and just listened to her, just listened to her, to see where she was. And, and what I learned was I can get more from listening to her than me responding back with a solution. Because it's in her talking, she was making her own solution happen. Mm -hmm. And Dee has been telling me this for years. That mm -hmm. My wife, you know, she says she's been telling me this for years, that it's times it's better to be a listener and hear what they're saying, you know, than to respond back and solve it. Because we have a tendency, when we see somebody going in the wrong direction, to interfere. And I remember uh, one of my mentors said, Charles, would you please take your cape off? <laughs> take your cape off. Hang your cape up. Hang your cape off. You know? Hey, your your mother was right. <laughs> she, she knows, she obviously knew her Bible. It's, you know, like, this first Peter is just a rehearsal of what's already there. The 34th Psalm where David, it's like, like a camp meeting. He says, he says, little children, sit down by the fire, and I'll tell you how to live long, how to do well. Mm. But that's what he, he says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are attentive to the crack. Mm. And so that's why mm -hmm. better off following the Lord than, than having to be swept up by him later. Amen. Amen. Yes? I, I would like to add something about the mm -hmm. asking also is a way to humble yourself mm -hmm. and that I believe that God wants to be humble and when you ask in a prayer it's it's a supplication mm -hmm. okay all right supplication okay. okay and it says here Lord Jesus your ears are always attentive to our needs open our ears and hearts so we could be attentive to the needs of others around us. And that's kind of what we're all saying about the discussion I have with this young lady, that if, if I open up my ears, I really hear what's going on, rather than any of us being willing to respond. And sometimes it's better to listen, to listen and possibly not judge, 
um, to be able to give them what God says. And sometimes I do believe that if we do listen more, God will bring to us, uh, God will bring to us, uh, God will bring to us what we're supposed to, to do. But I, I, I have, I have literally, I've, I've quoted so many. There's not, I don't think there's a student that's not come in my office. And this is not bragging, y'all. This is, this is not me. There's not been a student or a person that I've not been in contact with with a discussion about something in life that a word, the word of God has not come out of my mouth. And I want it to be that way. I don't want it to be my opinion. Because my opinion doesn't matter. It's what God says. And I had a young man named, I, I, you know, been with him, him and a few of my mentors, many of the young men and women that I've mentored, I've used the word of God to get their attention. And I didn't go, Matt, well, Matthew 6.34 says, well, let me open up my Bible and tell you what, blah, blah. I just said to them, students, I said, uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's struggles are enough. Mm -hmm. Just deal with today. That's Matthew 6.34. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus told them. He says, what are you worried about tomorrow? You know, when, when James comes back, Jesus' brother comes back and says, why do you worry about tomorrow when your life is like a vapor? When your life is like it just phew, here today, gone tomorrow, you know? And, you know, like when I tell, especially with uh, people who, especially in my area, where people are always in conflict. They, you know, like they want to fight. They, they want to get, they, you know, and I say to them, why don't you take it down a few times? And so when you open up, when we open our ears, God fills our ear. When we pray, God gives us the opportunity. God gives us the opportunity to speak to our hearts. When we're praying to God, God will bring, God will bring situations in our, um, in our midst. Not perhaps to take the situation away from us, but to give us clarity in the situation and what the situation perhaps is meaning. You know, um, I've heard people say things, you know, over time that sometimes God will allow things to happen that appears to be bad to us. Um, appears to be bad to us, but um, God has a greater purpose. You know, one of the greatest, uh, Joyce Myers talks about the uh, sexual abuse she experienced with her father. And, 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 and when she shares that story, every time I've heard her share that story, and I look at the audience of men and women in the audience, they're crying. What did she say? She talks about how her father, for the four years of through high school, just sexually abused her every, every, every Friday, every weekend. She was sexually abused by her father. But this, was a, but this was the testimony. The testimony was, not only did I get closer to God, but he gave his life to God before he died. And I was able to forgive him. And what she was sharing was that God will take a mess and turn it into a message. Now, some people, theology would say, why does God have to allow evil, right, mm -hmm. to show good? But that's what the cross represents. Let's go in. Did Jesus really have to go to the cross? I mean, you know, I mean, some people would say, why did he have to go to the cross? He was gone. Why well, put in the lesson in your eyes? It says loving difficult people is possible only because Christ's love for impossible people is much more than an example for us. Say that, say that last part. It's much more than an example for us. Right. 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 So God so God allows it so we can get better at it. Right? Is that what you're saying? Right? I mean, so when we look at bad situations, what we might prepare to what and and and, and for what Sister D just 
share. Sometimes I wonder is the bad situation more about our physical need more than our spiritual growth? Are we more concerned with our physical pain or physical comfort more so than our spiritual growth? I think, I, and I, and I, and that's that's debatable, right? I mean, we, we can debate about that, but I know for me, I don't like pain. I don't like pain. I don't like disappointment. I don't. I don't like it. But I can honestly say, I know for me, I've grown the most in it. I've become a better. I, I have. A, I have a thing that I read almost every week, and it's a story. And I move on to the last day. New eyes. It's a young woman who's watching this man who's a Sunday school teacher. And he literally has all hell breaking loose in his whole family. Everything's going crazy. Mm -hmm. Children on drugs, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And he says, every Sunday I come to Sunday school to teach, I want to quit. I don't feel worth. There's nothing in me. And the young lady who knew the family comes to him after class and says, don't take this the wrong way. But you're a better teacher because of the stuff you're going through. You're a great teacher because of the stuff you're going through. And he, and he said what he realized, which is 2 Corinthians 9, 12, and Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you, for it's made perfect and powerful in your weakness. So what Paul is saying to all of us, the weaker we are, the greater work God can do in us. And, and, and that is coming to new eyes. That as we look at, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus emphasized this as he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting killed because he's preaching a new way to deal with things. He's preaching, love your neighbor as yourself. He's preaching, forgive your enemy, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Right? He's calling people out when people are wanting to stone the woman who's a prostitute. And Jesus pretty much says, hey, who else here sin? Is she the only one that sin? And he said, what he said, he who without sin, let him cast the first stone. And from the oldest to the youngest, they said, I've been this stone, yeah. right? Then he says to them, who's your neighbor? Who's really your friend? He talks about the Levite. The priest goes by. But the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, the, the hated people of the time, is the one who picks the person who was robbed, take him to the end, bandage his wounds, and then, then, then Jesus says, now nah, who's your friend? You see? And so I remember, and I'm going to say this as I go to new eyes. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. But I don't know how God works in my life. When I was at Utica, two of the first gifts I got when I was struggling in Utica were from two of my Muslim brothers. They sent me a check quicker than any of my Christian brothers did. Wow. Hmm. Saudi and Burnett Marion sent me a check. They were the first checks I received oh, wow. to help me with my church. Oh. I sent the plead out to all my brothers. They were the first check, two checks I got. Hmm. So again, that for me is what Jesus is talking about. Who's your neighbor? See, yes. And the reason why he's saying this is because he's trying to get us to understand that he died for everybody. And he wants us, to, because if I'm ever going to convince, see, and, and, I, and I've said this, why I believe in Christianity is because I don't have enough on my own to do it on my own. It does not work. Right? Now some people it might. They might be able to keep the 613 laws. They may pray five times a day and wash their feet two times a day. Constantly. They might be able to do that. I can't. I don't know about y'all. Maybe you can. 
But he, the, God does for me what I can't do for myself. So when he talks about new eyes, he tells them to love one another. What he's trying to tell them is, by, he didn't say, go judge everyone. He didn't say, go build a church. He didn't say, you know, everybody that gives this amount of money. He didn't say, if you belong to this sect, that sect, this sect. He said, if you love one another, people will know that you belong to me. And I want to say, when I look at some of my evangelical brothers in America, where have y'all, they're off the rails. I mean, this is it, John 13. He's saying it. And he says, he says, at this moment that you fully realize that God who loves you unconditionally, love all your fellow human beings with the same love. A new way of living opens itself up. For you come to see with new eyes that they live beside you in this world. I always say to people, you read the Bible. If, you want, if, you, if you're a Bible reader, you read it. You read it for spiritual muscles. Right? Yeah. Right? Because when, when all when things start coming at you, you grab a word. I know for me, one of my favorite texts, if I don't ever want to tell somebody off in, in a meeting, Tell somebody off in church. <laughs> right? You could be you could believe that a pastor could say that. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29 is my favorite scripture. Paul says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth other than what's beneficial to those who hear it. So every time I want to say something, it's like God says, <clears throat> you keep your mouth closed. You quote it. Because again, you know, Faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. And so when you, when you hear this, he's saying that it is in, it's in us, God loving us unconditionally, we're challenged to do that same thing. You know? Can I speak to that? Sure. Because my entire life, on and off, I have lived in dangerous environments and and the thing about being knowing who your neighbors are, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a dangerous family, and uh, and um, still, and I pray for them all the time. And I'm, as you know, I'm getting ready to leave a situation, same kind of mm -hmm. problems. And uh, so, and I and I and I keep telling myself and uh, to pray for this person who's this fraudulent landlord that I'm dealing with right now. Um, and that's what God tells me, you know, love thine enemies. And I so I try to couch my words toward him uh, with that in mind. And um, it, I think we spoke about this before, we said something about Speaking gently to wrath, or, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Speak, uh, the way to turn wrath away is speak gently. Uh, speak when you when, when when wrath comes your way to use a, a, a gentle answer. Speak right. gentle, right? Answer, yeah. So when I, when I do deal with this person, he has a hard time being mean to me, even though he really tries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I just try to, you know, stay there with. With the words, um, I mean, I things go through my head what I'd like to say. Right. Oh, sure. Um, oh, sure. But I, I do hear God tell me you know, to, uh, well, to usually love thine enemies and mm -hmm. so speak grace graciously. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. And it's because, and it's, and it's, and it's, because and it's, it's, you know, I always say that, and it's because of that behavior, uh, Sister uh, Rebecca, that. You can win someone over. You know, we, we, you know, transformation takes place not by what I say, but by what I do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your actions will speak to what you, your actions will speak to how you can change a person's way. And again, you know, Paul said one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. So what you're doing with this landlord today. It may come about 10 years from now. It may come back 20 years from now. That's why you, you, any opportunity you get to be kind, even when it's difficult to be kind, 
Um, so you'd be surprised when you arguing with a person or discussing, and you and you get quiet. The quieter you become, you know, the more it gives them. They might let it all out, let them, you know, but um, self control. When you think of the fruit of the spirit, mm -hmm. it says love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And the last one is self-control. And self-control is, is a beautiful gift. Mm -hmm. Because because what self-control does, it allows you to take a step back. You have to say something. Scratching. Oh, scratching? Okay. All right. I think you're exactly right, but I think that too many people confuse uh, love and kindness with being a winner. Oh, yeah. Very much so. And being a Christian is not being a winner. Right. That's right. That's being courageous. Right. That's right. That's right. It's, thank you. That's right. It's not being a wimp. It's being courageous. Because it's courageous when you can walk away from somebody who you know you're going to beat down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just being honest, right? You know, I hear people say to me, I used to hear people in the church just say, I want to beat them down. And I say to them, I'm like, now, what do you think God would think of that? Mm -hmm. No, it's all about minister. <laughs> Don't go there. You know what you're trying to, you're trying to go there. No, no, I'm not going there. That, that was a different story. That's a different story. It's a different story. You know, I, I've heard a few of those back and forth with, with, with people. But again, you know, um, I mean, uh, uh, if you ever go to YouTube and see, see ministers fighting, you just sit there and shake your head and say, well, oh, yeah. You know, but again, you know, but again, you know, we got to remember they're human beings, yeah, yeah. and they're human, and, and, and they're showing the lack of lack of self control. But you're right; people confuse kindness and niceness as weak and meek. When you say a person is meek or humble, mm -hmm. humble, or you know, they they they're, they're cream puff. Mm -hmm. And um, in actuality, to me, it, it's it's a beautiful gift. It's 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 a gift that children learn very young, but lose as they get shaped by the world. You know, one of my godsons, Centel, uh, his father says, you know, I, I need to toughen him up, and I grab my godson and said, no, you don't. You need to love him. The world's gonna toughen him up. You know, I said, no, no, you gonna love him. But don't stop telling these boys you gotta toughen them up. No, no, no. You need to love him. The world will toughen him up. You need to show him what love. And I, and I say that because we do that. You know, I used to hear people say, you know, um, now when I hear people cry, I learned in chaplaincy, when someone cries, you don't hand them tissues. Don't hand them tissues. Because crying is a form of freedom. When many people cry, they're either angry, they're upset, or they're happy. Either way, it's a form of release. But we're very quick to handle tissue to wipe their faces. Because most of the time it makes us, in, un, us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then when I also learned as a chaplain, you know, when we run a prayer quickly, it's because we're uncomfortable. Maybe they don't want to pray. Maybe they just want to talk. You know? And so I say that to say that going in, as we end our lesson, it said, our slate is now white clean, which means that God accepts us into the family with no strings attached. Mm. Empowered and guided by Christ's transforming love, we see everyone with new eyes. We see the difficult people in our family and church family, our workplace and our neighborhood through the lens of Christ's redeeming love. And that makes all the difference. Loving people unconditionally, I wrote. Loving Savior, help me, help us, to see and deal with difficult people in life through the lens of your forgiving love. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to share this last part. I, ha I have a sister who I have a difficult time dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting down this afternoon, I was looking at a, a TV show. And I said to myself, I hope one day me and my sister can sit down and look at this TV show together and laugh. That's my hope and prayer. That no matter how much you know, no matter what, I hope one day, as I get over time, if her and I can sit down and look at this, you know, what show it was, it was Barney Miller, one of those old shows, one of those old <laughs> shows, and I said, we used to look at these shows and crack up laughing as kids, and I want I want that back one day, 
I want to be able to sit down with my sister and brother. I have good relationship with my brother. My sister and I, you know, we, you know, we, we you know, we, we, we've had our issues. But I, I want that. I, I want that with her because we had a good time. You know, and, that, and so that's my hope that she might see me as a difficult person. I might see her as a difficult person. But my prayer to God is that God can heal her heart and my heart enough to say, let's take our pride aside and let's, let's be, let's do what we used to do as kids. You know what I mean? So, praise God. Any other questions before we conclude, before I close in prayer? Any questions, any comments? Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We pray, dear God, that those who heard it online and those who were talking today are blessed by it. Thank you, God, for all those who spoke and those who were pondering and thinking. God, allow your Holy Spirit, as we get drawn closer to the cross, to help us see that as you told the, the disciples, this last commandment I leave with you, love one another. By you loving one another, people will know you belong to me. So help us, dear God, as a church and as a community to love one another so people can see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you all.